our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Howdy. Uh, I'm the worst at timing those videos. I either come too early, too late, and make it awkward for all of you, and then I stand here, and half of you can't see. I apologize. So here we are, though. Uh, we are in a series on prayer, and we, as Melissa said, are talking about specifically the Lord's Prayer. We're going straight to the horse's mouth and just asking Jesus, just like his followers did 2,000 years ago. We're saying, how do we pray? Teach us. We're coming with open hands and saying, we just want to learn from you. How should we pray? And what's really cool is, as I've been studying through this, uh, I preached yesterday, or not yesterday, it's fake news. I preached a week ago with Eddie and uh, with Breno, and it was fun. And, and even in that research, there was a guy named N.T. Wright. I don't know if you know that is a theologian. And he had this statement. He was asked about the Lord's Prayer, and this is what he said. He said, learning to follow Jesus is simply learning to pray the Lord's Prayer. And what he didn't mean is just reciting it. What he didn't mean was just going through it 15 times as some sort of penance. What he means is to truly take it in, believe it, and submit to it in the way that Jesus meant it 2,000 years ago. So we're going to jump right in. Matthew chapter 6. If you've got a brick and mortar copy of God's word, you can turn there. Uh, If you don't, one will be afforded to you on the screen. And here we go. These are the words of Jesus. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. He says, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And what I want to look at today specifically is verse 10. We attacked verse 9 last week, but specifically verse 10, where it states clearly, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because I think Jesus is going to challenge three core realities that all of us hold. Jesus in verse 10 is going to challenge our belief, he's going to challenge our control, and he's going to challenge our desire. All right? So we're going to start with belief, how verse 10 challenges our belief. There are things that I believed as a child that I later found out to be false. Anyone else? There are things you wholeheartedly believe as a kid because we grow up with this wonder as a child and we embrace things we thought were true and then we learned these things are not true. And I'm going to give you a few of those things. I grew up in, uh, I was born in 83, and so I was kind of a mid-aged kid when, um, do you remember Sammy Sosa, for any of you who follow baseball, and Mark McGuire got into kind of seeing who could, right? I thought they weren't on steroids. I believed (laughs) they were clean. I later found out that is not true. I believed as a child I would play professional sports. I believed the lie that you can be anything you want to be. What a load of malarkey. I am not built to be a center in the NBA. I believed mutants from the comics I read were real. I later found out, much to my dismay, and I still slightly hold it to be potentially true, that they weren't real. I thought when I was a kid, the Power Rangers were cool. And then I realized maybe they're still cool, but I think that's a no. I also (laughs) fully believed as a child that I would replace Michael Crawford as the Phantom of the Opera on Broadway. Also, newsflash, didn't happen. I'm here with you fine people. So there are things we believe and hold as children that we learn to no longer be true and because we have the wonder of a child. But what happens to the wonder of a child? Eventually, the world just... (laughs) 
beats it into submission and you kind of get jaded. A lot of us find ourselves there. And so what that causes us to do is sometimes we don't fully give ourselves to the things that we believe because we want to leave ourselves an out so we don't look stupid. We've been, we've been fooled so many times. What's that saying? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, what? Shame on me. We're like, no, 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 no. We're not going to be duped again. No, sir. I'm not going to be fooled. You fooled me once. It ain't going to happen again. Because we put this, this protection mechanism in place to say, no, I'm going to give myself an out. And we like that because then if the thing turns out not to be true, we can be like, I knew it all along. I didn't really, you know, like I kind of thought it, but I knew it's not real. You know, Lance Armstrong, also on steroids. I knew it the whole time, knew it. And we give ourselves an out. And listen, I think a lot of us treat God that same way. I think a lot of us specifically treat prayer that same way. We don't pray these bold prayers that Jesus is teaching us to pray. We pray kind of timid ones because we want to leave ourselves an out. And even in our good religion, we want to leave God an out. I don't want to put God in a box or make him feel like he's got to do a thing. Like God doesn't need you to give him an out. If God wants an out, God will take an out. But we've got to realize what is Jesus actually asking from us and what he's asking is to pray like this. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is an insanely powerful statement and it strikes at the reality of belief that we have in God and prayer. And it's the reality that many of us struggle with. We just wanna know if we are honest at our core, does prayer actually do anything? Tyler Statton in his book, Praying Like Monks, Live Like Fools, that we referenced last week, he talks about how many of us can be paralyzed in prayer between wonder and mystery. There's a wonder when we read about and hear the testimonies of all the amazing miracles that is ha have happened as a result of prayer. But the mystery kicks in when we're like, yeah, but how is it that this infinite God did something on earth because of a conversation with a human. Anybody else? Or you think you're like, how can God be that powerful but that personal? That doesn't make sense. The mystery that we find ourselves in is we have questions like, how does it all work? What took so long? Maybe a question I've asked, why not me? Why them? Why not me? Or we think there's some cosmic math equation that's like, Number of hours prayed plus number of people praying plus perfect method of prayer equals finally getting God's attention. Anybody thought that? You're praying about something, you're like, well, maybe I, didn't, I need to ask so-and-so. No, I shouldn't ask them. They don't, they're, they're not righteous. I should ask this other person, if I get this many people to pray and we're all, maybe there's too many people praying. Maybe there's too few. Maybe I didn't pray long enough. Maybe it was, maybe it was too long. Maybe I'm annoying the Lord now. Am I annoying you, Lord? Like, I mean, we just... We have all these bizarre questions about the wonder and mystery that we find in prayer. And the core tension is, do my prayers actually matter? And Jesus' unequivocal answer here is yes. And not just do they matter in some like out there somewhere since he's acknowledging a realization that his kingdom has not yet fully come and the prayers of his followers will be the thing that usher it in. Can you think about that for a second? But how many of us truly believe this? And maybe ask it like this. How many of us truly pray like we believe it? We're going to do an exercise, not calisthenics, so don't get nervous. But we're going to do an exercise here in the room. I want you to think of everything you have prayed for within the last week. And if you don't pray very often, it's okay. We're not going to do a show of hands. Maybe then you need to think of the last month. That's okay. But think about everything you can that you've prayed for in the last week. Now, what if God said yes to every single thing you've prayed in the last week? Would the world be any different? How much different would the world be if God answered yes to every prayer you've prayed in the last week? And here's the reality that I want us to wrestle with. There's a few of us prayer warriors in here that you're like, the whole world would be different. But most of us, the world's not all that different if he says yes to everything. Our relationships are a little better. 
Maybe we get paid a little more an hour or our salary goes up a little. Maybe we have a little more peace. Maybe we're not nearly as frustrated by that person. Maybe we're a little happier. Maybe we, God helped us with a little decision about go to school A or school B. But the world is not drastically different because far too many of us find ourselves praying safe prayers to give ourselves an out and give God an out. Right? You ever prayed for healing over someone and you're like, oh, I don't want to do this wrong. So like, God, you should heal them. But like, if you don't want to, like, that's on you. But like, you can, but you don't have to. But like, I'm praying for it. But like, if I'm not the right person, somebody like, we just love to kind of box it all in. But Jesus tells us to pray enormous world-shaping prayers like your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But this is where Jesus loses so many of us, right? Because if, if we really look at prayer, if we look at prayer as a way to meditate and let go of our anxiety and stress, most of us like that, right? Most of us can get on board with that. We're like, that's fine. I like that. If we look at prayer as a centering exercise, like, Lord, bring us back to center, to be here, present in this moment. Most of us go, I could see that. I like that. Some of us may even go as far to say prayer as uh, a way to kind of change my behavior and make me a little bit of a better person. I could get on board with that. But prayer that truly, really works, how many of us believe that? I'm talking like the kind of prayer that changes realities, changes outcomes, changes futures, affects real people in a real world. Can you imagine how much different our homes and communities would be if the followers of Jesus listened to Jesus, believed this, and prayed like this? Can you imagine how much better our world would be if his kingdom, if this world looked a lot more like his kingdom and a lot less like ours. Because his kingdom is a kingdom of love. His kingdom is a kingdom of grace. His kingdom is a kingdom of peace. His rule, he's always out for two things, his glory and our good. I'm not even always out for my own good. Even in the moments I think I am, I can see how my desires have led me astray and destroyed my own life and the people around me in ways that I'd be flabbergasted to tell you. We don't even manage our own will well. Jesus tells us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But why do we struggle to believe it and live like it? Tyler Statton in his book says this. He says, if we really took Jesus' invitation seriously, if we really believed in the sort of prayer that Jesus talked about, the modern church would have a hard time getting its people to do anything but pray. If we really took him at his word, it'd be hard for me to get up off my knees in prayer and go do anything else because I'd actually believe that my prayers mattered. Think about that. I think you might find yourself as I do. Sometimes I struggle to believe it. And not just cognitively, but that 70,000 mile journey seemingly between my head and my heart. So here's the question we have to wrestle with. What do you and I do if we struggle to believe this? And you're going to love the answer. It's going to come as a complete surprise. Are you ready? Pray. If we struggle to believe it, the answer is to pray. Why? Because we get to come to God in prayer completely as we are with all of our doubts, all of our insecure beliefs, and we allow him to realign our hearts and heal our disbelief. We come to God and say, God, I'm gonna pray it. Help me believe it. Help me believe it. Do you truly believe in what Jesus says will happen if you pray? Okay, so Jesus is challenging our belief, but second, he is challenging our control. And even as I said the word control, some of you like let out a, a smirk, a grin. I'm not sure what that was. Maybe you're uncomfortable in your seat. I'm not sure. But maybe that's because there are some people in this room that would identify as control freaks. Would that be anybody in this room? You don't have to show hands. But would any of you identify as a control freak? Would any of you be willing to identify the person sitting next to you 
as a control freak. Many of us love the idea of control. Some of us, like me in my sickness, when we go on road trips, I generally don't let anybody else drive because I don't like the feeling of not being in control behind the wheel. Anybody else? Maybe nobody's quite that sick. But like, I just, I just like the feeling of control. But when Jesus says, your will be done, that's a direct challenge to my heart and yours. When he says, your will be done, Father, it causes us to trust that his will is actually better. Now, remember, Jesus is coming to this line in the prayer from our Father who's in heaven. Hallowed be your name. He is Father and he is holy. He cannot sin against us. But what we have to wrestle with in this statement of your will be done is if God is a loving Father who is holy, listen to me, he's going to want things for us, his children, that we don't want. And I can show you this in real life. I don't know if you're aware, but my children have an imperfect father. I I am not even close to perfect. But I look at the life of my kids and they've got a lot of desires that are terrible for them. My children desire, my children prefer, my children want to eat ice cream for every meal not with every meal, for every meal. My children would like to play recklessly in the parking lot at Best Buy and Target. My two-year-old would like to help me use a giant chef's knife to cut the vegetables for dinner. My five-year-old would prefer to hit her sister every time she gets angry. My nine-year-old would prefer to only have fun all the time and have zero responsibility. But even as an imperfect father, I can see how damaging it would be, not only to them, but to all of their future relationships, if I gave in to all of their desires and wants. You get that, right? If I was like, you know what? You just do what you want. I'd have a two-year-old with no fingers. I'd have a five-year-old that grew up to be a woman that thinks Hitting is the only way she can get what she truly wants. And I'd have a nine-year-old that grows up and is just trying to have a party 24-7 and cannot fathom what it's like to just wash your clothes and brush your teeth. It is wrong for me, unloving for me, foolish for me, silly for me, and harmful for me to give in to all the wants and desires of my children. We can all see that. Letting them do all that they want is the least loving act I can do for them. How much more a perfect father? I can't see their future, but God can. I can't see their motives, but God can. I can't see their feelings. I can't see their thoughts, but God can. And if we're honest, there are so many things that feel natural to us. There are so many things that we want, right? And our father wants to hear all about those, but proper relationship in prayer starts with the submission to his will, not our own, saying, it doesn't matter what feels natural for me, Lord. It doesn't matter what I want the most. What matters is what you want because you are a loving father who wants my good. You can't pray the rest of the Lord's prayer without a posture of submission, To submit our control to God in this way is not only to accept all that he wants to give us, but to say your will be done is also to accept all that he may want to take from us. It'd be too easy to preach this sermon and look at this passage and be like, the Lord just wants to bless you. You just gotta get out of the way and let him. And it's like, yeah, he does wanna bless you. But sometimes he blesses you by the things in your life that you hold so tightly to with control. And he removes those things from you so you can finally have the desperation you ought to have for his will, not your own. This is why Jesus begins the prayer with our father. He's out for our good. But the reason prayer builds up our relationship with God is because praying this way forces us to treat God, listen, as a person, not a commodity. And if you don't understand the difference, I'm going to give you an illustration I heard from Tim Keller one time, and it works so beautifully across the board, and it definitely works in my own home. 
My wife's name is Deshay. She's sitting right over here. It's her nightmare that I would point her out in this environment. But my wife can come to me, and if you're married, you'll understand this, and even if you're not married, you'll get it. My wife can come to me and say, do you love me? And anyone who knows me, and she knows, the answer is yes. Even in our deepest frustrations, the answer is always yes. But then she may ask this question, why do you love me? And gentlemen, I'm going to teach you a valuable lesson here. Because if I'm not careful, I am stepping into a trap. It's a trap. Like I know, I see what's happening and I'm just gonna give you some some wisdom here. It's easy for me and I do this, it's easy for me to default to my list of why I love her and say, I love you because you're such an incredible mother to our children. I love you because you're so unbelievably organized and can find the thing in the refrigerator that I spent 30 minutes looking for and cannot see. (laughs) I love you because of what an incredible best friend and partner you are to me. I love you because of how loyal you are to me. But you know the danger in going down your list? I'm treating my wife as a commodity, not a person. What I'm doing in that moment is I'm saying, you know what? I love you because of all that you do for me. Thank you so much for being a means to all of my ends. Thank you so very much that you do all of this for me. You keep doing that and I'll love you. She's not wanting to hear a list of things that she brings to my life as to why she is loved. The correct response to why do you love me, to treat her as a person, not a commodity, is to look at her and say, I love you because I know you. I know you. I have given myself to you and you have given yourself to me and that is why I love you. If I don't get another thing from you, I love you for you. I love you for who you are. That's the way to communicate to her. You are not a commodity. You're not an object for my enjoyment. You are a person and I know you as a person and I love you as a person and forever, all your hopes, dreams, thoughts, fears, desires, I want to know those so that I can continue to love you better. You see, to tell God your will be done is to say, Father, I love you for you. Your will be done. It's not not what you give me. It's not all the things you provide for me. I know you. I know who you are. I want to know you more, and I love you for you. And I want to know. You tell the Lord, I want to know what makes you happy. I want to know what makes you sad or frustrated. I just want to know who you are. I didn't come here just to receive. It's when we pray like this, like Jesus says to us, that's when we treat him as the ultimate person not as a cosmic genie, not as a gigantic vending machine, but we truly come to him and say, Lord, if I get nothing else, I just want you. That's that's all I want. You are out for my good. I trust you with it. Your will be done. John Wesley used to pray this exact prayer. It had a couple of these and thines in it that I took out to make it easier to understand, but this is the prayer he would pray. I want you to listen to it. John Wesley would pray, I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you want. Rank me with who you want. Put me to doing or put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or lay me aside for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours, so be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. That's a heck of a prayer. That's what it looks like to flesh out your kingdom come your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give me everything, give me nothing. Let me work for you, lay me aside. You want me, you want me to succeed and prosper? Great. You want me to suffer? I'm in. Your will be done. Do you struggle to pray something like that? 
I know I do at times. And even cognitively in our heads, we can lie to ourselves and be like, no, 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 I pray that every morning, right? Okay, great. Do you live that way? Do you live with that kind of release of control to the Lord that literally whatever your will is, I am in full submission. Wherever that takes me, whatever that means, I'm turning my back on everything else and I am following you. Do you struggle to give up control completely and say, Father, your will be done in my health. Give it to me or take it from me. Your will be done in my home. Your will be done with my kids. Your will, not mine. Your will be done with my spouse. Your will be done in my singleness, Lord. What you want is what I want, no matter where that takes me. Your will be done in my work. Your will be done with my wants. Your will be done in my life. Your will be done. If you struggle to pray that, do you know what the answer is? If you struggle to release control, do you know what the answer is? You're going to totally love it. It's going to come as a complete surprise. Pray. The answer to it is prayer because we get to come to God as we are with all of our misguided fantasies about control and we get to let him realign our heart to see the true path toward freedom, which is to surrender control to the one who will actually leverage his will for our good. Submitting our control to God really comes down to one thing, and this is what I'm gonna close on. It comes down to one thing. It comes down to what do we truly desire? Do you truly desire God's way or do you truly desire your own? So over the last month or so, um, my daughter finally wore me down to start reading the Harry Potter books with her. I know the judgment in this room dramatically jumped. Some of you got very frustrated. Some of you got very excited. I had never read a Harry Potter book. I'd never seen a Harry Potter movie. And I always used to make fun of you Potterites or whatever you call yourselves but here I am. And I just read through the first book and there's this really interesting item there called the Mirror of Erised. And it's desire spelled backwards, so it's not really that creative. But the Mirror of Erised is a mirror that is said to, and this is the exact quote from the book, to show you, this mirror shows you the deepest, most desperate desire of your heart. I wonder if I had such a mirror right here, and I called each of you up one by one to gaze in it, what does it show you? You see, the mirror doesn't lie. The mirror doesn't show you what you want to see. The mirror shows you what you most deeply, desperately desire. What do you see in the mirror? Based on your true desires, what do you see? based on the, what the evidence of your life would say about you. What does it show you? Does it show you with some new status? Does it show you with the comfort you've been so desperately desiring? Does it show you finally achieving some level of security you were hoping for yourself? Does it show you finally with that companionship you've been desiring more than anything? Does it show you swimming in a pile of money? Does it show paparazzi taking pictures of you because you're just trying to get famous? Does it show you approval that you've been searching? Maybe it shows your boss finally shaking your hand. Maybe it shows you that approval from a family member that you've never gotten. Does it show you that promotion, that girlfriend, that house, that life, that body, those friends? If a mirror would show you your deepest desires, what would you see? Jesus, in just a few verses in Matthew 6, in verse 33, he tells us what ought to be our deepest desire. He says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things will be added to you. It's that, it's desiring his kingdom, the same kingdom that we're saying, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Once you desire that more than anything, that's the only reason, that's the only time that everything else will make sense. Because when you seek the kingdom first, it puts in perspective the way that you treat other people. 
You don't have to work hard to love other people when you're seeking God's kingdom first. Why? Because your desires will be in line with God's desires. And if your, God's, if your desires are in line with God's desires, loving people will come relatively naturally to you. Why? Because he loves people really well. Serving people will come relatively naturally to you. Why? Because serving people is what he does, and he showed that most through Jesus. Sacrificing in your family won't be that foreign to you, gentlemen, because you will be looking to one, chasing one, who sacrificed for his family. To pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven is to say, Father, I don't know what it all means for me yet, but align my desires with what you desire. It's to pray whatever you want is what I want. I lay down my kingdom. I lay down my will. I lay down my hopes. I lay down my dreams. I lay down my fears. I lay down my reservations and I give them freely to you to do as you will because I love you for who you are. Now, I'm not pretending that that prayer is easy. I think even those of us with the most beautiful hearts would find it difficult at times to see what God's will may be for our lives. And I say that because that's what we see in the life of Jesus, isn't it? Do you remember there's this time where he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night he is betrayed, the night before his death? What do we see of Jesus? Is he just having a good old time partying it up? No, he's laboring in prayer. And he's saying, God, if there's any other way to do this whole thing, let's do it. And what does God the Father say? No. So what does Jesus model for us? He says, okay, not my will then, but yours be done. In a moment of his greatest suffering, he goes, Father, if that's it, your will be done in this. And George MacDonald says there's two kinds of people in the world. One there are the people who in this life will say, God, Father, your will be done. And number two, there are people who will not say that in this life and they will stand before a holy God in judgment and God will look at them and go, okay, your will be done. You didn't want me in life. You don't give me an eternity. I'll give you exactly what you want. That's what hell is. That's what eternal judgment is. That's why the plea today is to say, lay down your will to his and say, your will be done because I want to be the person that on this side of eternity says, your will be done so that, and I stand before God one day, I didn't do it perfectly, but by the grace of Jesus Christ, he looks at me and says, hey, you bowed the knee, not to all this other junk. You bowed the knee to me. Come to me now. You wanted me in life. You get me perfectly now in death and through eternity. That's what Jesus purchased For us, if you struggle with belief this morning, Jesus has the answer. If you're a control freak, Jesus has the answer. If your desires are all out of whack, Jesus has the answer. If you struggle with anxiety, Jesus has the answer. If you feel trapped, Jesus has the answer. Be honest, if you're not even sure how you feel, but you know you've just tried everything else and it hasn't cashed out, Jesus has the answer. And his answer is trust and pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Even for those of you in the room who do not believe in Jesus yet, this is good news, great news for you. Do you wanna know why? Because what I can tell you with absolute certainty as I look back at the moment where Jesus is laboring in prayer in the garden is that before you could ever hope to desire him, he desired you. Before you even drew a breath, the Bible says we were enemies. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And he did it because it was the will of the Father. The book of Isaiah says it was the will of the Father to crush Jesus. He knew that he would be bearing the weight, not just of death, but of experiencing every hell that ever would be forgiven as he, in a moment, for the first time ever, experiences separation from the Father in his death so that he can pay the penalty for sin. Today, if you do not believe in Jesus, I tell you, there is a God who before you ever had a chance to choose, desired you first. And he did that through his son Jesus, living a perfect life, giving up his life on the cross to fall in line with the will of the Father for all of mankind because he is a good and loving Father who is always out for his glory and our good. And today, all you need to do to trust him is to say, Lord, I believe you. I believe what you did through Jesus Christ. I trust it. I bow my knee and say, not my will, but your will. I turn from my sin and I'm heading your way. I'll do it imperfectly, but I'm gonna follow you and trust Jesus Christ and what he did. That's how you trust him today. 
But for those of you in the room who say, I do trust Jesus, that's already me. Well, fantastic. We're gonna do one closing exercise together. I'd love everybody to just close their eyes. And we're gonna ask the Lord a couple simple questions. Right now, I just want you to ask God, say, God, what do I struggle to give you control over? This week I did this exercise and I would just tell you if, you, if you're asking him, it was helpful for me to hold my hands like a clenched fist as though I was holding on to something. And what I challenge you to do is think of something in your life that you're wrestling for control over. Maybe it's something you've never released to God. Maybe it's something you released in the past, but you're trying to grab it back. When you've come up with whatever it is, name it. Don't leave it nebulous, name it. And then I just opened up my hands upward and just imagine myself legitimately releasing that, saying, Lord, you can have it. And then with my hands still open, I just imagine the Holy Spirit filling whatever it was I just released. Because the Lord won't leave you empty. Whatever you release, he will fill with his presence. He'll give you peace in place of anxiety. He'll give you trust in place of fear. And the last question I want you to ask God is, I want you to say, Father, do I desire anything more than you? Would my life say, would those around me say that you are my entire desire? If the answer is yes, there are things you're prioritizing. Just ask the Lord to help you come back. Ask the Lord to help you stop bowing your knee to those other idols and come back to bowing before God so you can say with faithfulness, your will be done. Lord, today I pray that you'd make us a church like that. As individuals and collectively as a church, I pray that we would be a church that believes. We believe what you say about prayer. We believe what your word says about prayer. We believe there is power in prayer. We believe you in that. But I also pray that we would be individuals and a church who would say we don't desire that control because we'll screw it up. We give you complete control of our lives, of our homes, of our purpose, all of it. We give you complete, entire control. Your will be done. And then I pray we would be a church that our chief desire, what we would be known for by our coworkers and family and friends and community is that we are desiring you above everything else, not the approval of man, not anything else in the surrounding junk that the rest of the world pursues, but we are coming after you, Lord. Make it so in our hearts. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you stand with me right now? We're going to jump into a time of communion. Listen, if you if you're here and you trust in Jesus, this is for you. If you're here and you don't trust in Jesus, all good, but this won't make any sense because what this is, is we have bread that represents the body that was given to us by Jesus. And we have juice that represents the blood that was shed for us for the forgiveness of sin by Jesus. And I would challenge you, if you are a believer today, we thank God for the communion that he purchased so that we can even be heard by a holy, righteous God to say, your kingdom come, your will be done. He hears us because of Jesus Christ. And so what we're going to do is you will exit out the right, starting in the back, coming down, take the bread, dip it in the juice, take it back and don't be in a rush. Take a moment, worship, reflect on all that it means to be in communion with the living, eternal God of the universe and how he so desperately desires to have relationship with you. So we can begin.